Exodus, a great round of applause for what God's doing. Amen. And we're able to take singles. We have co-ed, men and women, and then also we have families. We have families like we see here. And we also have, uh, there's another couple, they, they went uh, back to where they had a few things they had to take care of personally, but they also had three little boys, and they're going to Australia next month, and we have a single mom that has a child. So what I'm saying is, it's not just for the single young people, but it's also for the young adults, young families, single moms and dads. Come on, somebody. We're all called to go make a difference. Amen? So... It's exciting. You can see us. Uh, we're going to be at the promo table after service right there in the foyer. And also you can go to victorarch.org and click on the MTC logo and you can get a lot of information there or ask us questions at the promo table. Amen. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it to church this morning. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get into the word here this morning. I want you to open up your Bibles with me. To Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And we're going to read a few verses here just to lay out the scenario of what's happening there with the children of Israel and lay us a foundation of what I believe the Lord wants us to hear this morning and be ministered to. Did you come ready? Come open? Filled with faith? Yeah. Amen. It says this in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Somebody say seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves dens, and caves and strongholds, which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And then they would encamp themselves and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as the locusts, both they and their camels were without number. They would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of, Midian, of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to Israel and said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you from Egypt, and I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and also out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. Come on, there's the promise. And also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And verse 11 says this, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, not Oprah, but Ophrah, which belonged to Joas, the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, you're mighty. If they're a man, say, you're a mighty man. If they're a woman, say, you're a mighty woman. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Father, we just thank you here this morning, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit that's in this place. We've had such a tremendous morning thus far, Lord God. An awesome first service powerful praise and worship and preaching. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just continue to do something so powerful that all of our hearts would be ministered to and that none of us would leave the same. And we're careful to give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. We all say amen and amen. Thank you once again, Pastor Hal. Praise the Lord. Here we see how the children of Israel 
were in a situation for a few years. That year after year, seven years consecutively, they would sow into the land, work the land, toil the land, water the land, and then wait anticip- they would anticipate and wait for the harvest. And then all of a sudden, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the east would come in when it was harvest time and then begin to ravage the land and take all of the harvest that the people of God worked so hard for. This was happening year after year, harvest after harvest. And we see how the state of the people of God were, they were hiding in dens and hiding in caves and hiding in, you know, uh, the wine press and hiding in different places. And we see how a man was in a state of mind that was really a mighty man of valor. That's why God spoke to him. He said, you're a mighty man of valor, Gideon. But he was in the wine press. He was in a place where he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, threshing the wheat, but in the wrong state of mind. He was getting the harvest, but yet it was just a little bit for him and his family. He wasn't getting the full harvest because he was hiding away because he already knew that the enemy was coming. He already knew that the Amalekites and the Midianites and the people of East were coming because it was harvest time. So he was gathering in what he could and he was threshing wheat, but in a wine press. Now, when they would thresh wheat in those days, they would take it to the top of the mountain because of the air and the wind that needed to blow when they would toss it up and the, and the wheat would come down and the wind would blow the chaff away. And then you would have a pure harvest of grain. But yeah, he was in a wine press, and the wine presses were in the valley. They weren't at the mountaintop. They were in a place of the valley. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing, but in the wrong place, the wrong state of mind. He was supposed to be on the mountaintop getting the harvest, celebrating, being joyful, having a great time, getting what he worked so hard for, but yet he was hiding away in the wine press in the valley, just trying to survive. But how many know that's not what God has called us to do, to just survive? God's called us to thrive. We heard it this morning that, that church should be a happy place. God should be serving him joyful. We walking in victory every step of the way even though yeah we go through hard times even though there's trials and hardships that come our way but we should walk from a stance of victory every step of the way we should be on the mountaintop getting the harvest that has come not in the valley just trying to survive sometimes we go through those seasons Sometimes we go through those seasons, and yes, there will be trials. Jesus said, yeah, you're going to face hardships here on this planet, this earth, while you're still here. But take joy. I have overcome, and because I have overcome, you also can overcome. See, it's not that we're trying to get the victory over the enemy, because Jesus already got the victory. When he died on the cross and went down to hell for those three days and he took the keys of death away from the devil and he said, no more will you uh, oppress my people. I'm going to pay the price for them. I'm going to cover their sin with my precious blood and I'm going to show you what I'm getting ready to do. And on the third day, he resurrected because he is life itself. Death could not hold him down. He is the victor, and we got the victory. And we are victory outreach. We're not defeated out. We are victory outreach. How many can say amen? So we're not trying to get the victory. Jesus already got the victory, and he gave it to us. It's, it, it's, it's, we're walking by faith in the victory. We're fighting from a stance of victory. We're fighting from a stance that that we know that we can overcome because we are more than overcomers. 
We're fighting from a stance that we are more than conquerors. We're fighting from a stance that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We're fighting from a stance that God is for us who can be against us. We're fighting from a stance of victory. By faith. By faith. By faith, we're living out the word of God. By faith, we're taking what it says in here and applying it to our life. By faith, we're pursuing our purpose. By faith, we're, we're pursuing our destiny. By faith, we're reaching people. By faith, we're discipling people. By faith, we're releasing people into their God-given destiny. By faith, we're doing what God's called us to do. But something happened to get in those seven years. The mighty man of valor was found in a wine press trying to just survive, but God wanted him to thrive. So God came and he said, Gideon, what are you doing here? You're a mighty man of valor. You got to remember who you are. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget that there's a leader in you. Don't forget there's a lion in you. Don't forget there's a a giant slayer in you. Don't forget that you are a mighty man of valor. Don't forget. That's why he, when, when God came, he, 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 he had to remind them. He says, I'm the one who delivered you out of Egypt. I'm the one who set you free from the bondage of those taskmasters. I'm the one who took you out of the world and brought you into the promised land. See, you got to remember, they were already in the promised land. But they weren't living to the fullest. They were living life, but not life to the fullest. Because of the attacks. Because of the wearing down of the enemy. How many know that when you go through trials... You go through this attack, and you go through that attack, and you go through this attack, and the devil's hitting you, I mean, every which way that you can think or imagine, sometimes it wears you down. That's what he wanted to do in Revelation. He says that the devil tried to wear out the saints. That's why he sent the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east. See, the Midianites, that was a son of Abraham with his second wife, Keturah, after Sarah died. He had Midian. But actually, Midian, when you look up his name, it means strife. And he even had strife with his brothers, and Abraham had to cast him away. Sometimes we go through strife from within and strife from without. The enemy will come in, especially strife from within. How many know that? Did you know the most miserable person in the world is somebody that knows God but yet not living in the perfect will of God? The most miserable person person in the world is somebody that knows God but is not living in the perfect will of God there's a battle going on inside there's strife inside and they're being torn between two worlds this world and God's world that empire but yet God's kingdom I'm telling you here this morning that if we just align ourselves up with God's perfect will that joy is going to come back that peace is going to come back God's providence is going to come back God's purpose is going to be fulfilled in our lives The Midian, I strive, strive from within. And even, you know, sometimes we go through it with our brothers and sisters, right? Come on. I mean, sometimes we do. We go through it with our work, colleagues at work and our family and different things. But how many know that God wants us to unify and come into agreement and say, we're going to love each other as one family because we're one family, one army, one ministry, and we're going to pursue God's calling. The Amalekites, that was a grandson of Esau. Esau, we all know the story about Esau, Jacob and Esau, the two twins. And Jacob, you know, he, he jived and connived 
got his, his brother's birthright. But his brother sold it out. <laughs> Even though he jived and connived, but he, he wanted that thing of God. <laughs> God dealt with him later on. But the sellout was Esau. Sold out his future with God, his birthright. Sold out his destiny for just a moment of flesh. Whew. Just a moment of just satisfying this monster. Because how many know that the flesh is a monster? The fleshly appetites, the fleshly desires. Esau just sold out his birthright for a bowl of beans. Didn't even get tortillas with it. No rice with it, just a bowl of beans. Sold out an eternal glory for a temporal satisfaction. The people of God were getting attacked. Not only from within and from without, but also their own fleshly appetites. The Amalekites, those were the first ones after God delivered them out of Egypt. They were the first battle they had to fight on their way to the promised land was the Amalekites. How many know that the first battle you wake up to is the battle of the flesh? Every day, it's not like you're just, you know, you get filled one time with the Spirit of God. you you got to be filled daily. we got to get up and get into prayer and get into God's presence daily, my friend, because there's a world out there that is contrary to the things of God that wants to destroy us. We have an enemy out there called the devil, oh, Big Red, that wants to destroy us. We also have this flesh that is in a constant battle between the spirit and the flesh. My friend, the moment we wake up, we have a battle to face, and that's called our flesh. I mean, how many wake up in the morning like just filled with the Spirit of God and you're just ready to, to get into God's presence and ready to pray and just ready to take on the world? Let me see your hands. Okay, okay, okay. Well, let me have a meeting after the service with you because I want to know the secret. <laughs> I want to know the secret. Because this flesh, man, is a beast. It's a monster. <laughs> you gotta fight it every day don't let nothing get in between you and your relationship with God don't let nothing 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 that's something you gotta protect that's something that's gotta be most precious to you most precious to you value your time with the Lord that quality time just like we value our quality time with our spouse and with our children and with our leaders and with our brothers and sisters, how much more should we value that quality time with our Savior and our Lord? The Amalekites, fighting them. The desires of the flesh, fighting them. Even the people of the East, the people of the East, when you, when you study who they were, they were nomads east of the Jordan. Meaning this, symbolic for those things that were east of them entering into the promised land. The things that were before that would try to hold us back and hold us down from entering into the promised land. Those old desires, that old man, that old woman, those old things. How many know that sometimes we can get caught up in the good old days? And sometimes those things can hold us back and hold us down and hold us from entering into the fullness of Christ. The people of the East, those things that were before us entering into our promised land. Before God changed us, saved us, set us free and gave us a possession and a promise. Those things, we can't afford to let the old man rise up. We can't afford it. It'll try to come back. That's why the Bible told the people of Israel, don't touch dead things. <laughs> if the old man is dead, then don't touch him. <laughs> because it'll contaminate our new life in Christ. For those who are in Christ are a new creation. All things of old have passed away. And behold, everything becomes new. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, well, I don't know Jesus yet 
I, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. Well, today is your day. God is going to do something inside of your life. Don't leave this place the same. Don't leave this place without asking Jesus to come into your heart because he has a new man for you. He has a new life for you. He has a new day for you. There's a new horizon that hope is rising up that you can change. You can become that man after God's own heart. You can become that woman after God's own heart. You can become that man, that mighty man of valor and that man of destiny. Don't let the old man come back to life. That's why I, 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 keep, I keep a picture of my ID that was three months before I came into the men's home 17 years ago. And I keep it. I keep, I keep it on me. I keep it, I keep it right there. And I reflect back because that's what, that's what God was doing. He was reminding them. I'm the one who set you free. I'm the one who delivered you. I'm the one who took you out of bondage and gave you a promised land and gave you freedom and a future. So I look at that ID and I say, oh, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that I'm not on meth no more. I thank you that I'm not on cocaine no more. I thank you that I'm not in sin no more. I thank you that I'm not oppressed no more. I thank you that I'm not in the wine press no more. I thank you that I'm not bound to fear no more. I thank you for what you've done for me. How many grateful people do we have in the house this morning? Don't ever forget what God's done for you. Reflect back and always remember. And if God did it before, I'm telling you, God can do it again. If, if you're facing a giant this morning, if you're facing an impossible situation this morning, if you're facing something that you know you can't overcome by yourself, just remember how God did it for the lion and how God did it for the bear. God's going to do it for this Goliath that you might be facing this morning. God is able. Somebody shout, God is able to overcome fear. I believe, honestly, that I believe when it all boils down, Gideon, a mighty man of valor, I believe he was afraid. I believe he was afraid of himself. I believe he was afraid of the enemy. I believe he was afraid even possibly of his future. I believe he could be even afraid of the unknown. I believe he could have been afraid of a failure. That's why he was just there in a box, just surviving, limited, being held down and held back. But the, there was a giant in that box. There, there was a giant killer in that box. There, there was a mighty man of valor in that box. The, that's why God had to come down and take the limits off. To peel back the cap, to take the lid off, to take the ceiling off, to break through. We heard this morning, we need some breakthrough people that would break through the barriers that they face in life. And this morning, I believe my assignment for you this morning is it's time to take the limits off. It's time to break through. It's time to be all that you've been called to be. It's time to rise up and be that giant killer. And it's time to rise up and take a city. It's time to rise up and take a nation. God is calling those that are saying I'm not going to live in a comfortable state I'm not going to live afraid no more but I'm going to live in the fullness of Christ and I'm going to fulfill my destiny if that's you this morning give God a great praise take the limits off break through overcome fear faith overcomes fear Gideon had to believe God for what he said he had to take it and believe it and step out on it. And we see how he got out of the box. He got out of the wine press. He got out of the limitations. And he began to lead his nation into victory. But it wasn't just a one-time thing. Because how many know fear is real? And if we're all honest here this morning... We're all afraid of something. See, a courageous man or woman is not a man that is absent of fear. It's just a man that allows courage to help them overcome that fear. 
How many need an injection of courage this morning? How many need their faith elevated this morning? How many need a, just, a, just a double dose of the Holy Ghost this morning? Boldness, revival, faith, courage to break out and break through. Because we see that there was many times that it was mentioned by God when he was dealing with Gideon. Not only in the wine press, but also when he was challenged with different challenges. To go tear down the bell, the altars of Baal. Gideon was afraid, so he took ten men. But God told him to do it himself. But he took ten men. And then after all the different things uh, that God was doing to get the army ready, to go face an impossible situation, Gideon, after being in a wine press, listen to this, after being in a wine press by himself, alone and afraid, God speaks to him, you mighty men of valor, rise up, I got a purpose for you, you're going to lead the nation into victory. Goes, tear down the altar of Baal. Puts God through another test because he, he was still doubting. He was still afraid with the fleece. We know the story of the fleece. But then all of a sudden, he begins to mobilize the army. Now, a nation that was completely afraid, all of a sudden, because Gideon, stepping out of the wine press, begins to mobilize 32,000 men. Now, get this. It just shows you who was really in that wine press. It was really a sleeping giant that was in that wine press. But when God got him out, he began to give the call out, and 32,000 began to follow him. From zero to 32,000. <laughs> but then God says, okay, great job, Gideon. But you got too many guys here. If, if, if I was to just release you and go fight the army, you would claim victory for yourself. You would, you would claim the glory for yourself. So I'm going to give you a little series of tests to see who's really with you. Even though you got 32,000, but just ask those in a meeting, 32,000 and one, in a meeting, who's afraid here? So he did it. Okay, guys, we're going to go fight this army that's as numerous as the locusts. They're, they've been killing us for seven years now. You guys ready? Who's afraid here? 22,000 left. <laughs> 22,000 left. 10,000 remained. Okay, all right. God, we're ready. We got 10,000 soldiers, and we're going to go overtake the enemy. No, 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 no. Still got too many. I'm going to put you through another test. If they drink water this way or drink water that way, then I want you to separate them to the right and to the left. So he took them down to the brook. They drank the water. And those that just got down on their face and lapped it up, they went that way. 9,700. And the 300 that stayed alert and attentive and kept a watchful eye for the enemy and brought the water to the mouth, he separated those 300. And he says, now... Okay, tell those 9,700 to go home and be with mama. Because, because they still got too much of the world in them. They, because if you read the commentaries and, and find out why did they bow down and put their face to the river, because that's what they did when they worshiped Baal. They would bow down to the idol of Baal, and then God says they still got too much world in them. Tell them to go home. They still need to get through the process. I'm going to use them later on, but they need to go through the process of changing and growing. But these 300 right here, these are the ones that you're going to go face an army, an army that is innumerous, an army that you can't and count and I bet Gideon was standing there and saying God are you serious <laughs> I just had 32,000 guys and I just had 10 now I got 300 or 10,000 I got now 300 are you serious God says yeah and guess what if you're still afraid this is what he's telling he, he's constantly dealing with his fear because how many know that that can hold us back? Fear can paralyze you and, and Im immobilize you and hold you back. He's constantly down. He says, if you're still afraid of going down, 
to the camp, then go down. <laughs> That's what he says. He says, if you're still afraid of going down to the camp, then go down and take one guy with you, your servant, and go listen to a conversation that's happening in the camp of Midian. Now, I'm just, I, I, I got a, you know, uh, a very uh, extraordinary imagination. So I'm just trying to figure this out. You know, I had all these guys, but now God just, you know, tells us to take 300 to face this army that's impossible. And now he knows I'm still a little afraid because when God has a question, it's not that God needs to know, it's that we need to know. And he was still dealing with a little bit of fear. So God tells him, just take your servant, go down into the camp of Midianite. At night, by yourself, with your servant. See, what God was doing, he was, he was putting him through a process of overcoming the fear with faith and obedience. He had to believe God for what he said in the, in the wine press. Uh, he, He's a mighty man of valor. I don't belong here. I need to step out. Now I need to go take care of this and take care of that. Now I'm still a little bit afraid, but I need to go down into the camp. He was putting them through a process of faith and obedience that was going to disintegrate and destroy the fear in his life. Faith and obedience destroys fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And how many know that when we show God we love him is because we believe in him and we obey him and follow him. That we love him. So he takes his servant into a camp that he's getting ready to go fight. That cannot be counted. There's too many. Three armies. So he takes his guy. And can you imagine this guy that's afraid and he goes down by himself into this camp if one person recognizes him as, a, as an outsider, then, then they would have killed him right away. He had to really overcome his faith, or fear with faith and obedience. So he comes down. And the Bible says that God told him to go to a particular tent and listen to the conversation that was taking place in this tent. There was two guys talking about one of them had a dream the night before. And he was telling him the dream. And he's saying, I had a dream last night that there was a big barley loaf that was on top of the mountain and it came tumbling down and it hit our camp of Midianite and it destroyed the camp and it destroyed everybody. And the other guy interpreted the dream and he says, that is none other than Gideon and the Lord. Get, the Lord has given Gideon the camp. Whoo! Now you gotta, you gotta know what's happening here. A guy that's afraid to face this army, he comes down into their camp and he's listening on a conversation that they were having dreams about the night before. That that the Gideon, a Gideon was coming tumbling down and wiping out the whole camp of Midianite. See. Some of us, the devil, he wants to pump so much fear into us by giving us nightmares. Nightmares in our sleep. Nightmares during the day. Fear is false evidence appearing real. He'll try to appear big and try to put this stuff in front of us that would try to cause us to shrink back and hesitate and, and not step out. But God didn't call the devil to give us nightmares. You got to listen here. You got to catch this. If you don't catch nothing else, catch this. God didn't call the devil to give us nightmares. God has called you and I to give the devil nightmares. I'm telling you, when you rise up and you step out by faith and you obey God and you fulfill his purpose, you're going to become a nightmare to the enemy. You're going to become a nightmare to the devil. You're going to become a nightmare to drug addiction. You're going to become a nightmare to gang violence. You're going to become a nightmare to prostitution. You're going to become a nightmare to the enemy. Oh, it's time to rise up, my friend. It's time to rise up, my friend, because 
there's people on the other side of your obedience uh, that need to know that there's a real God that's made a real change in you and I and that can make a real change in them. You become that nightmare to the enemy. It's not a turn to stream back. Man, God's doing something powerful here. Woo! And I'm not saying that nothing's happening here. Don't get me wrong. Because this is something powerful that God's doing here. But there's still so much more to do. There's still more people to reach. And he's looking to you and I to rise up and take the limits off. And to live a life of faith and obedience. To overcome. Because that very, there's going to come a day. And the worship can come on up. There's going to come a day that those who take on the challenge of really being all that God's called you to be, there's going to come a day the devil's not going to rip you off no more. The devil's not going to steal your harvest no more. There's going to come a day, if you continue to read through chapter 7, when they overcame all the Midianites and Amalekites and the people of the East. I mean, they showed up with flashlights and a trumpet. I mean, it's like God didn't even give them a sword. That's a whole other story. Showed up with a flashlight and a trumpet. But just through faith and obedience... They smashed the light, the light sh shone, they blew the trumpet, and God caused there such a, a havoc and chaos in the camp of the enemy that they started killing each other. They didn't even have to fight, they just had to show up. They just had to show up by faith and obedience because the battle is not ours, but it's the Lord's. And some of them tried to get away. Some of the leaders of the, the uh, Midianites and the different ones were, were running away and they pursued them. And one of them was called Zeb. And at the end of chapter 7 it says that Gideon pursued Zeb. And he caught him in the wine press. And he destroyed him. There's going to come a day that that very thing that had you and I in the wine press... There's going to come a day, my friend, that God is going to put that thing in a wine press and you're going to overcome it all the way. You're going to overcome it all the way. All the way. That fear, that doubt, that old life, that all oh, that thing that was keeping you down. You're going to stomp on it, my friend. You're going to be on top. It's going to be on the bottom because God didn't call us to be on the bottom. He called us to be on top. He called us to be the head and not the tail. You're going to put it in the wine press. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to challenge you. Whatever you're facing, whatever you feel that is holding you back from just being all that God called you to be and all that God calls you to do, whatever it is, today if you come to this altar, it's symbolic that you're going to put that thing in the wine press. You're not going to be on the bottom. You're going to be on the top. You're going to live a victorious life, a, a, a joyful life, a life of purpose and meaning, a life that is completely to the fullest of us. That you hear this morning, and you're saying, I feel the devil holding me back, but I'm stepping out. And I'm stepping into my destiny because I know God's called me. If that's you, I want you to come down. Come down to these altars here this morning. Put that thing in the wine press. Put that thing under your feet. Put that devil under your feet. Put that lie under your feet.